Hey all, Scott here. Nine steps ago, I wanted to experience hardships and indigestion. But then I discovered this nine step plan on how to successfully fail in the video game industry. And now I'm finally broke and depressed. So now it's time to spread that bankruptcy to you. Here's how to successfully fail as a video game studio. First off, please take a look at this. Yeah, I sh my pants too. This is some scary stuff. We want to do this, but fail. So maybe if we eliminate the N's, the T, the E, the D, the O, and throw in some A's, some C's, an L, and an M. Well, son of a bitch, we have ourselves a role model. The video game industry can be tough stuff. These things take so much time, money, and manpower to put together. If one game a developer makes doesn't meet expectations, it could be enough to sink the whole ship. Because of that, many publishers believe new releases have to be strategically crafted and well thought out in order to make the most money possible. In-game purchases and microtransactions, day one DLC, collector's editions, gold editions, they will take any opportunity to melt the most out of people's excitement for a new game. It must be exhausting. Like, think about it. Would you really want to be a video game company? I tried being Activision once and it was hard. Nobody liked me. I was too scary and I laid off over 800 people. It was the worst Halloween ever. But sometimes, even after layoffs and cost cutting, some studios don't make it far past that and get shut down, experiencing the worst fate possible having the same company status as a claim. For some reason, it doesn't feel like a claim is gone. Now, that's a name that just screams video games. It's one of the first publishers outside of the main ones these days that I think of when the whole concept of video game company is brought up, and I don't know why. They were never a particularly great company. They published a few NBA jams, the first two Burnout games, Turok, some console versions of Mortal Kombat, and a whole lot of licensed games. They filed for bankruptcy in 2004, and what didn't you know, we haven't melted yet. So I guess a claim's existence isn't vital to our lives, but it's still hard to believe they haven't been around for that long. They're just an unforgettable name in the industry, uh, just like Midway. Their name is tossed around a decent amount for a dead company, and that's because Warner Brothers bought up their assets after they went bankrupt in 2009 and still used their name for re-releases of their old arcade titles. With these two companies, their names are some of the bigger ones from gaming history. Uh, well, looking at them both, it's pretty easy to see where things went wrong. Midway found most of its success in the arcades back in the 80s and 90s, so in my opinion, while mismanagement and poor decisions can be blamed for their bankruptcy, when they were forced to compete in the console market, it seemed like they were having a tough time trying to keep up with the competition. They had Mortal Kombat, but not much else. And Acclaim was just never really that great overall, so when standards of quality with video games went up, their profits went down. In retrospect, the death of a video game studio is pretty understandable and easily explained, but sometimes their demise comes out of nowhere, they just randomly get shut down. And that's always varying degrees of depressing. Even then, I'd say the idea of Atari becoming defunct has lost all meaning. Every time I open up the fridge, there's an article about Atari being bought or going bankrupt. This Atari, yeah, not the same as this one, or this one. The name has gotten traded around for years, so while Atari is still in existence, it has next to nothing to do with the Atari everybody knows from the 70s and 80s. This current Atari used to be Infogrames. Talk about a name I've seen hundreds of times, but know nothing about. This looks like they wanted to call themselves Infogames. That name was already taken, so they went, huh, huh, yeah! Infogrames acquired Hasbro, which acquired Atari earlier, which they then renamed themselves to, Jesus. Hasbro Interactive's gone too, man. Who else is gonna make the game of life for PC in 1998? But that's just what happens a lot of the time. Many game developers and publishers are no more, but live on because of mergers or acquisitions. Sometimes Sometimes meaning the studio still exists, just now with a different name. Remember Namco? Remember Bandai? Why not merge the two together? Now we have Namco Bandai Games, which then got changed to Bandai Namco Games, which then got changed to Bandai Namco Entertainment. Thank God they changed that three times. Squaresoft and Enix, both well known for Japanese RPGs, merged to become Square Enix. Konami acquired Hudson Soft and basically just absorbed it into the whole company later down the line, killing off the name. Well, I mean, at least one of Hudson's franchises lived on after the merger. That just shows that sometimes a studio is no more just due to restructuring. Nintendo EAD was the development studio behind mainline Mario, Zelda, Animal Crossing, all the primary Nintendo games, and they no longer exist. But that's just because Nintendo restructured their development studios by merging Nintendo Entertainment Analysis and Development and Nintendo Software Planning and Development into one in-house studio. Nintendo Entertainment Planning and Development, Nintendo EPD. Now, when a studio is acquired by a bigger company, that must mean that studio is safe from being shut down, right? What are you, stupid? It is heartbreaking and frustrating to see a studio get bought out or started up just to make a few games and then get shut down a few years later. And it's something that happens shockingly frequently.
Bizarre Creations made Blur and Geometry Wars shut down by Activision. Lionhead Studios made the Fable series shut down by Microsoft. Capcom Vancouver made the Dead Rising game shut down by, uh, Capcom. Gorilla Cambridge made Killzone Mercenary shut down by Sony. Blackbox made Skate and Need for Speed games shut down by EA. Maxis Emeryville made The Sims and SimCity shut down by EA. Visceral Games made Dead Space shut down by EA. You see a pattern here? It's just, why even buy these studios if you have them make a few games and then shut them down and lay off employees? These are giant corporations always looking for new employment. Surely they could have relocated a lot of these employees to other subsidiaries they own. Like most of the time, the studio is shut down when the games they made underperformed and they're no longer profitable, but that's not really a good majority of the employees' fault, so why not relocate them elsewhere in the company? But sure, everything happens for a reason. A lot of studios end up getting merged, the studios that got shut down were because the games they were making weren't selling, the parent company didn't see much worth with keeping them around. I get that. It's incredibly sad to see a company that made legitimately good games close down and to see employees get laid off. That's never fun to see, but... These companies are trying to run a business. Most of the time, I doubt the CEOs say, man, I'm just dying to shut that studio down today. The studio shutdowns are mostly done for strategical reasons. These companies are businesses at the end of the day, and sometimes they have to make tough calls that negatively affect a lot of people. It's sad, but it has to happen sometimes. There's that, and then there's Activision laying off 800 employees to cut costs when the CEO makes 30 million a year. What the hell? So it's pretty easy to fail at succeeding in the video game industry, so let's dive into a few key examples of studios that succeeded at failing. Disney Interactive Studios was one that just kind of shut down out of nowhere, and it hit me hard. I love Disney Magic Artist Studio on the PC. Of course, they primarily made Disney-related games, and they also dabbled in the pure market, but their last major project was Disney Infinity, developed by Avalanche. This was a part of the whole Toys to Life trend Skylander started, where you buy toy figures, you can scan into the game. But Disney Infinity used figures of pre-established Disney, Marvel, and Star Wars icons, which you'd think would translate to a bigger success. Well, it was a big success, but not big enough for Disney, because by Disney Infinity 3.0, Disney announced they were abruptly canceling the line of games and figures. This obviously wasn't a long time coming because plans for a fourth game and new figures in general were already being developed. Of course, Disney is a smart corporation. I think they could see that Toys to Life was a dying fad and it was smart to pull out of it before they had a flop on their hands with Disney Infinity 4.0. It was a dying market, why try to make more money from it and have a bunch of unsold figures and games on your hand? And after canceling the future of the Disney Infinity franchise, they closed the entirety of Disney Interactive Studios just to really stick it to us. Disney Interactive suffered major losses over the years, and while Disney Infinity was enough of a success to help the division stay afloat, the writing was on the wall that Toys to Life was fading away, and with a future without Disney Infinity, Disney Interactive didn't have a reason to exist in the company's eyes. Why develop their own games when they could just license their brands out to video game publishers like EA? That was a great idea. That's actually the same reasoning behind Disney closing LucasArts down. They bought out Lucasfilm in late 2012 and then closed their video game division in April of 2013, laying off a good chunk of employees. LucasArts made some of the most beloved adventure games out there, with some big names in the pipeline at the time, like Star Wars 1313. And to just see that all go away almost immediately after being bought out was disheartening to fans. The reasoning for shutting LucasArts down was simply because Disney found the prospect of licensing out their IPs to other game developers to be more appealing. That was a great idea. Speaking of LucasArts and their adventure games, a company that was seen as the modern equivalent to them also happens to be one of the biggest company shutdowns in recent memory. Telltale Games. Now these guys have been around for a while. I initially heard of them when it was announced they were making Back to the Future the game in 2010. It was a point and click adventure game that basically acted like a fourth Back to the Future movie. They were mostly known for doing stuff like that, taking well-established media franchises and turning them into episodic story-based adventure games. They worked on a bunch of titles, but really hit the big time in 2012. Telltale's The Walking Dead was a monumental success critically and commercially. It told a great story, popularized the episodic release strategy, rejuvenated the story-based graphic adventure genre, and it came out at the height of The Walking Dead franchise's popularity, which definitely helped things out. Everything was in this game's favor. Telltale really had The Walking Dead to thank for its mainstream success, and also eventual demise. He just picked up too many projects and pumped out too many games in such short periods of time. Yet ever since 2012, their games never really improved since The Walking Dead. They really didn't evolve along with the industry and instead just kept doing what worked back in 2012. Episodic story-based adventure games based on popular media franchises. They would generally have three series running at the same time each and every year, which was just a bit much for most to keep up with. The formula was showing fatigue and oversaturation, and in late 2018, it was announced that Telltale would be closed closing down, right when they were in the middle of releasing the final season of The Walking Dead and had a fair amount of upcoming projects in the works. At least Skybound Games came in to finish up the final season of The Walking Dead, but it's still sad to see Telltale gone. The closure really came out of nowhere for me, I wasn't expecting it at all, but when I actually thought about it for a second, 
it made too much sense. Like, I remember everybody playing The Walking Dead when that came out, and a few of their other games after that were pretty big, but by 2018, I just didn't hear anybody really talking about Telltale's games. They truly made some great stuff, but when it was obvious that they had to change things to keep up with the industry, it was too late. However, I'd make the argument that one of the most famous downfalls of a company was the when I think THQ, I think licensed games for the GameCube. Some good, some bad, most completely mediocre, but still a worthwhile presence in the industry. When it came to the original franchises, they had Saints Row, Destroy All Humans, The Blob, Darksiders. Good stuff, definitely, just not the biggest names, but they did have licenses for Pixar and Nickelodeon games for a while, so that kind of made up for the lack of notoriety. Like I said, the GameCube era was really when THQ was firing at all cylinders. Licensed kids games were pretty popular back then. During the Xbox 360, PS3, and Wii era though, that that's when they started to struggle, and that was partially because THQ said, you know what Nintendo's gonna do in two years? Yeah, let's fail before they do. The UDraw tablet, released in 2010, it was a drawing tablet for the Wii. A pretty solid idea overall, but I think THQ really poured too much into this one. They could've gone away with just the tablet and the drawing software bundled in. But no, they made a bunch of games that required this thing. I never really thought the UDraw tablet was worthy of being an accessory that should be mandatory for certain games. Like, that's something Nintendo does for their own console with stuff like the Wii Balance Board or Motion Plus. You really think THQ was able to do that themselves? You draw games were mostly licensed kids titles, and I feel like a lot of parents that just wanted to give their kids some Kung Fu Panda 2 action on the Wii were disappointed when they realized, oh, we need this third-party drawing tablet from some failing company. But really, the you draw problem started coming in at full force when THQ decided to release it for the PS3 and Xbox 360, yikes. Put this sign up anywhere, you'll scare somebody. While the UDraw tablet on the Wii did okay, the other consoles flopped hard. UDraw wasn't a big enough success in my opinion to warrant spreading it to other consoles primarily attracted an entirely different audience compared to the Wii. This tablet was one of the biggest contributions to THQ's bankruptcy, but other factors were definitely still at play here. Licensed kids games were starting to become less and less of a thing, like just think about how many there were on previous consoles compared to the Xbox 360 onwards. Especially a few years ago on modern platforms, like without acclaim and THQ pumping out movie tie-in games, it made Activision releasing some garbage Ghostbusters game really stick out. If I had to guess why licensed games aren't as prevalent now, it may be due to development costs being pretty expensive for HD consoles. But we have been seeing more tie-in games recently, and oh my god, I think they found a way to avoid high development costs, and it's to not have development costs, it's genius. But licensed games were THQ's bread and butter, so when those weren't doing well, they tried to buckle down and focus on more mature, hardcore titles. It didn't really work out because most of their games were just pretty average. Sure, stuff like Darksiders and Saints Row have their fans, but when they were mainly banking on the game Homefront to save them from shutting down, I think that shows THQ without the tie-in games wasn't really much at all. They filed for bankruptcy in early 2013, auctioning off their assets. Games in development like South Park The Stick of Truth were bought up by Ubisoft, and franchises like the WWE series were bought by 2K. Currently though, THQ is back in some form. Nordic Games originally bought up the majority of THQ's original franchises, and later in 2016 bought the THQ name and now operate under THQ Nordic just because the name THQ is still pretty iconic, especially compared to the name Nordic Games. Their entire game plan seems to be to acquire every single B-tier game franchise ever conceived. THQ Nordic will probably acquire the state of Nevada soon. When a game company goes under, it blows. Tons of people lose their job, games may be canceled, franchises are in limbo. It's never a good thing when a solid studio goes out of business. At least there's potential that franchises will be bought up by other, better companies, employees will get new, better jobs incredibly quickly, or the studio will be merged with a bigger one and nothing really changes outside of the studio's name. While everything happens for a reason, a game company shutting down is always one of the sadder things to read in the news. And there you go. Listen to me talk for 13 minutes was step one of our nine-step plan. We only have eight more to go until this bankruptcy meter goes even further down. I can't go through with this. We need to make money quick. We're selling soup now. It always works.